Vietnam is one of these places that is really often overlooked, both from East and Southeast Asian perspectives. People just don't know enough about Vietnam. Before, when we said Vietnam, we really meant one group of people. We meant an ethnicity we call the Kinh, the ethnic majority of modern day Vietnam. Vietnam is not just this ethnic majority. It's over 50 different ethnic groups in the modern state. It's not just the 90 plus million people living in modern Vietnam, but it's millions and millions of Vietnamese people of multiple ethnicities living all around the world, including the U.S. What was this idea of a single unified Vietnam that r runs from the Red River Delta down to the Mekong Delta, this long S-shaped country? Vietnam in its present day borders didn't exist until 1802. And even after 1802, it only existed in the blink of an eye before it was divided again uh, into three regions and then into two regions and then ultimately divided at the 17th parallel during the Cold War. The Vietnam War is, is a pivotal moment in American history. And it um, contributed to so many of the ways in which modern American thinking evolved out of the mid-century. You should study Vietnam because it is one of the countries that has flown below the radar, but is one of the emerging kind of powers, right, economic powers. It is the 15th, last I checked, 15th largest country in the world with a population larger than all Western European countries. It is the fourth largest growing economy in the world. It is an agricultural and manufacturing superpower. It is the, in terms of agriculture, it's the second largest producer of coffee, the second largest producer of rice, the fourth largest manufacturer of furniture and clothing. Geographically speaking, it occupies probably the primest real estate in the Asia Pacific region and thus of great geopolitical strategic importance, especially when we're thinking about Chinese ascendancy as this global superpower in the next coming years. Why Vietnam? Why did Vietnam uh, lose millions of people in the post-1945 era to the French Indochina War, to the Vietnam War, to the Sino-Vietnamese War and the Vietnamese-Cambodian War? What was so important about Vietnam that so many people died in that country uh, in the second half of the 20th century? And I break that down in my courses. And I do that because as we enter the 21st century, there's a different why Vietnam? Why is Vietnam so important in terms of regional relations to the balance of power between the United States and China. So there's a very different answer to why Vietnam, and I think they're equally important to understand the tragic past of the 20th century and potentially the important bright future that Vietnam basically holds by virtue of its position geographically for the 21st century. You know, Vietnamese were both victims as well as agents in their very tragic 20th century history. And here what I mean by being both victims and agents is that on the eve of American intervention, there was a brewing Vietnamese civil war. And that, that civil war really holds the answers to why the Vietnam War unfolded in the way that it did. That the United States need not and should not have have entered the war in 1965 and poured in, you know, hundreds and thousands, million soldiers, uh, to which 58,000 died in Vietnam. Vietnam is definitely going to be one of the most vulnerable countries in the world um, to climate change for a couple of reasons. I think Vietnam is a great place for students to go look at environmental problems because it really encapsulates everything at once. Like it is urban development, cities are expanding so rapidly. It is about the impacts of climate change on coastlines. And we know particularly in Asia, so much of the population is concentrated on coasts. So if we don't do a good job of figuring out how we're gonna manage coastal development in the face of climate change, the rest of Asia is in trouble as well. Vietnam is a fantastic place to also be thinking about the impacts on food supply because so much of the agricultural production in Vietnam is really important on the world market. And so if we don't get that right, there could be food security implications for the rest of the world. So to me, Vietnam is like everything all at once. Like it is all of the environmental pressures that we have in the world 
in this small place where you can really get in and see it. You can go to the Mekong Delta, you can see sea level rise, you can go to the urban cities and you can see the heat island effect. It's hot sometimes. The Mekong Delta is really Vietnam's bread basket. I mean, it's the rice basket. It generates an enormous amount of the agricultural production of the country, um, and it gets exported to the world. So it is a world dynamo in agriculture. And part of the reason why it's so successful is because rice agriculture has adapted to flood regimes and weather in the Mekong Delta over hundreds of years, and now all of that is changing. Any sort of sea level rise, any sort of change in the river regimes has huge consequences for the 20 to 30 million people, depending on um, whose statistics you use, who live in the Mekong Delta in Saigon. So what are we, how, how are we gonna manage this? This is not something that um, you can just sort of build some engineering solution and it's gonna go away. Vietnam is kind of like the canary in the coal mine for what lots and lots of countries are gonna have to do um, to cope with climate change. I'm particularly interested in the interwar years, uh, so the period of uh, kind of the 1930s. This is a really interesting, fascinating period of Vietnamese history because it is the period in which um, Vietnamese national identity and Vietnamese nationalism really um, was coming together. Um, and so we can't really understand uh, the period of the war, that the, the revolution, and then of course the war with the French, and then the war with the Americans, without understanding this really vibrant period of, of Vietnamese history. So without understanding Vietnam as a colony of France. France. Historically, that geopolitical, you know, space that it occupies has historically made it a place where any number of civil civilizations have collided, right? It is, it's really a kind of like sort of nexus of colonialism, of, you know, interactions with China, with India, with, you know, the entire Southeast Asia region. So the most widespread view in the field is that Vietnam has been confronting the threat from China, that China has been trying to dominate Vietnam over two or four thousand years. So Vietnam uh, was locked, has been locked in that difficult position and that's how we must understand Vietnam today. I've looked at how Vietnam emerged as a nation, as a country on the southern frontier of China, you know, among various other frontier polities like Champa, like, you know, the Khmer Empire, like, you know, various other, uh, you know, uh, polities on, on the Chinese frontier and how Vietnam became a, a dominant country in the region, how Vietnam became a hegemon in the region dominating uh, Laos and Cambodia, and at some times uh, were engaged in war with uh, Siam, which is modern Thailand. Vietnam actually has faced some threats from China at different times in history, but compared to the threats from the other polities in, in the southern frontier of China, the threat from China is not as uh, important to the Vietnamese. And today we see that, you know, the influence of communism has waned. And even the communist government of Vietnam today, they uh, pledge loyalty to communism. But then, you know, in fact, on the ground, you see, you know, market activities, economic activities, uh, lively social uh, activities that don't conform to uh, communist values that challenge the communist uh, system. And you, so you could see that Republican values in terms of you know, support for freedom, democracy, human rights, rule of law, are coming back to Vietnam today. Only a couple decades ago, we would have a very narrow idea of what modern Vietnam is or who the Vietnamese people are. Um, sometimes that, for example, would not include any diasporic peoples or any ethnic minorities or even women for that matter. So I work on the history of the Vietnamese language and how what we call the Vietnamese language came to be formed. And language is one of those things that people have 
you know, people don't think very often about. We tend to think of it as a kind of core vehicle for our, our cultural identity. And one thing um, that if you take a look at the Vietnamese language a little bit more closely, you realize is, for example, somewhere upwards of 70% of the words are borrowed from Chinese. In fact, the Chinese influence on the Vietnamese language is far greater than on either the Japanese or the Korean languages. It's, it's changed almost every system of the Vietnamese language. And that's because of this long period, over a thousand years, where Chinese and Vietnamese speakers lived side by side, coexisted in a bilingual society um, before the emergence of modern Vietnamese states. So, you know, with regard to, you could ask, why, why is it important to study the history of a language? Well, there's lots of reasons, but mainly when I think one of the most interesting reasons to study the history of a language, particularly a language like Vietnamese, is that it forces us to ask, what do we have in common with the people who came before us in a particular culture? What is our connection? Historically, a lot of people, when they thought of Vietnam, they thought of this kind of rural society, right? It was like a peasant-based society. And a lot of that is informed by historical agrarian relations, but also stereotypes, right? But Vietnam is full of these amazing, vibrant cities like uh, Ho Chi Minh City, also known as Saigon, or Hanoi, or even Da Nang in central Vietnam, and smaller sized cities as well all over the country. Vietnam itself, in the 2000s when I was doing my research, is kind of like on the edge too. It's sort of like in between spaces too. It's like people would co constantly talk about how it's a you know, the last remaining, one of the last remaining socialist places, but it's really capitalist, right? What is it? It's in between all these things, right? It's East Asian, like influenced by China, but also influenced by Southeast Asia. They're, they don't eat the, with soy sauce, they like fish sauce, all these kind of in between categories that people will talk about Vietnam, right? And so I got interested in how you could take those categories and think about them in terms of a city. Right now in Vietnamese studies, both modern and pre-modern, really what everyone is doing in each of their disciplines is breaking down those preconceived notions about what Vietnam is and who the Vietnamese people are and sort of interrogating them. And what we have in, instead is a very broad, diverse, and rich array of questions as far as what Vietnam and the Vietnamese people are. You know, like when people try to say the Vietnamese perspective about something, that should be a red flag right off the bat because the Vietnamese are just as complex as any society in the world. Like if you were to say the American perspective right now and someone from a party you don't believe in trotted that phrase out, you'd be annoyed by that, right? And I think we forget that when we talk about other countries sometimes. And Vietnam in particular has been subjected to this kind of, this notion where experts will sometimes trot out their false claim to be able to speak the Vietnamese perspective. There's no single Vietnamese person who can speak the Vietnamese perspective. You know, according to one scholar, there are more than 35,000 titles on the Vietnam War. That makes it, you know, I think there, there are more studies on the Vietnam War than there are on the American Civil War, and it's coming close to the Second World War. Despite that, there's so much that we don't know about that conflict that, you know, just until recently, we didn't know that President Ho Chi Minh and General Bao Nguyen Zap were not the ones in charge of that war. What else don't we know? I think, you know, despite the fact that Vietnam is, and it is very true that Vietnam is more uh, than a war, that it's a country with its own politics, its society, culture, etc. You know, we, we also can't ignore the fact that the Vietnam War was critical to the country's development moving into the 21st century, and that there's so much more about that war that begs for further study. Another sort of reason to, that this exact moment is interesting and important it has to do with the dichotomy between Vietnam, the state, the nation, and the diaspora community. That there is now the beginning, I would say, the very, very beginning of different types of dialogues between Vietnamese living in Vietnam and Vietnamese who fled at the end of the war because of the destruction of South Vietnam. Those kinds of conversations could never have occurred before. Um, there was too much pain, too much trauma, and now enough time has passed where we can start to stage those conversations in an incredibly fruitful way. And I think that's actually, that has never been possible until really very recently. And that's one of the most exciting things about Vietnamese studies today.